I want to talk about this story from the New York Times. It's very closely related to the impeachment proceedings because it is also in the article of impeachment. Of course, we're talking about this criminal investigation that's taking place in the state of Georgia. Georgia prosecutors are now investigating Trump for that Raffensperger phone call. Uh, if you recall, he was on the phone with him. Trump had his attorneys, Raffensperger, who was the Georgia Secretary of State, who was the subject of a lot of the election litigation controversy because the allegation was that he sort of modified the Georgia rules at the last minute by entering into the settlement agreement with the DNC. And the settlement agreement, unconstitutionally is the allegation, modified some of the underlying electoral election rules that were taking place in the state of Georgia. And because he modified them pursuant to the settlement agreement, the argument goes that that was outside of the purview of what the legislature is duly authorized to do. The legislature can change the rules. The secretary of state, who is a function of the executive branch, cannot. So what's, what Raffensperger did arguably was unconstitutional. I think Lynn Wood's lawsuit is still still up in the air about that, right? I think it's knocking on the door of the Supreme Court. I think they're going to be considering whether they're going to hear that later in the year. We don't know. Probably not, but we'll see. So that was the issue. Now, Donald Trump gets on a phone call with his lawyers. Raffensperger's on the phone call with his lawyers, and they're talking about it. They're having this phone call, a settlement conference, and Trump lays some pressure on him. I thought it was not appropriate pressure but I understand it in the context of a settlement conference. Okay, we're going to talk about a settlement conference. Let's take a look at this article. Georgia prosecutors open a criminal investigation into the Trump phone call. State officials are being instructed to preserve documents related to, quote, attempts to influence the Georgia election, including a call in which former President Donald Trump asked the official to, quote, find votes. Prosecutors in Fulton County have initiated a criminal investigation into Trump to over in his attempts to overturn Georgia's election results, including a phone call between him and Brad Raffensperger, the secretary of state, where Trump pressured to find enough votes to help him reverse his loss. On Wednesday, Fannie Willis, the recently elected Democratic prosecutor in Fulton County, sent a letter to numerous officials in the state government, including Mr. Raffensperger, requesting that they preserve documents related to, quote, an investigation into attempts to influence the administration of the 2020 Georgia election. It says this investigation includes, but is not limited to, potential violations of Georgia law prohibiting the solicitation of election fraud, the making of false statements to state and local governmental bodies, conspiracy, racketeering, violation of an oath of office, and any involvement in violence or threats related to the elections administration, the letter states. In addition to the Raffensperger, the letter was sent to Brian Kemp, Jeff Duncan, Chris Carr, and then later on in the article, it says here that former prosecutors said Mr. Trump's call might run afoul of at least three state laws, which we're going to take a look at. One is cr criminal solicitation to commit election fraud, which can either be a felony or misdemeanor. As a felony, it's punishable by one year in prison. There are other related conspiracy charges, which we're going to look at. And then there's also a third offense, misdemeanor uh, offense, called intentional interference with the performance of election duties. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at all three of those. I clipped some of those. Actually, I think I clipped five different statutes. Three are the same that they were talking about that is allegedly criminal. And then the other two are talking about their election rules and what a settlement conference might look like. So to just help you frame that out. All right. So let's take a look at the first charge. First charge here was criminal solicitation to commit election fraud. Okay. And so solicitation means you know, you're asking somebody to do something for you, right? I think probably the most commonly known term of this is solicitation of prostitution or soliciting a prostitute, right? You're going out and you're saying, hey, hey, baby, what's going on? right? You're soliciting a prostitute. Same type of thing here. There's a charge out of Georgia 21-2604 that says criminal solicitation to commit election fraud. So in other words, Trump is asking Raffensperger to commit election fraud. And here is what it looks like. So under subsection B, we've got the penalties. Subsection C, we'll take a look at. All right. So number one, A1 says a person commits the offense of cr criminal solicitation to commit election fraud when with intent that another person engage in conduct constitu constituting a felony under this article, he or she solicits, so that means you know, they're asking, Trump is asking, requests, commanding, importunes, otherwise attempts to cause the other person to engage in such conduct, right? And so, you know, you could, you could make arguments on this, I think, both ways, right? I think the first argument would be, well, Brad Raffensperger is a secretary of state. 
Uh, so if he is moving things around in terms of votes or if he's deciding, well, these are valid, these are not valid, then that's not a felony, right? That's just the normal operation of his duties. He's allowed to make those judgment calls. Now, the subsection C here, I think, refutes that argument. It says the provisions of A through C are cumulative and shall not supersede I'm sorry, that's D. We don't need D. We need C. It is no defense to prosecution for criminal solicitation to commit election fraud that the person solicited could not be guilty of the crime solicited. Right. So that means that, uh, you know, Raffensperger essentially had the authority to go man maneuver those votes. And those that would not be a felony. So therefore, Trump. Sort of soliciting him, requiring him to make those changes. The fact that it wouldn't be a felony if he made those changes does not exonerate him from potential criminal liability. So that's how I think they could manipulate that. Now, is it by Donald Trump engaging in this conversation with him, is, was he ever intending them to commit a felony, right? Intent that another person engage in conduct constituting a felony, right? This is big. Intent. Did Donald Trump intend that he go commit a felony? under this article. No, I don't think so. I, I listened to the call. We read the transcript here. We've gone through it multiple times. He was in a settlement conference where he was asking to, be, to find, according to his language, to find more votes, not to manufacture them. He was just basically saying they're having a conversation about counting votes. Okay. I have to, I have to keep beating this point home. When, when I'm in a settlement conference for a criminal case, guess what we're talking about? Criminal charges, plea deals, sentencing, how many years, what evidence can come in, what evidence can't come in. We're arguing about all of the elements of a criminal case. Same thing happens in family court. You're arguing about custody of your kid. Same thing in divorce, right? You're talking about the, the wife gets the house, he gets the kids, he gets the car, he gets the, right? You're talking the toilet paper, the ice trays, whatever you want. You're duking that stuff out. When you're talking about an election and litigation involving an election, guess what you're talking about? Votes. You got to talk about votes. That's the only thing you can talk about. So Donald Trump was talking about votes and he was saying, Brad, look, we've got these issues here. We think that these were fraudulent. We've got these change of address. You got that. Whatever the buckets were. I can't recall them all right now, but issues with the counting. He's having a conversation about that, right? And they're making their claims. Litigation, multiple lawsuits were pending at the time. So they're having a settlement conference to talk about the votes. He wasn't saying, based on my reading of this, hey, go print out 11,000 ballots and shove them through the, count the counting machine. That wasn't the conversation. He wasn't asking him to fraudulently manipulate the votes. He was having a conversation about the methodology of counting the votes, which it may sound foreign to many people, but this is what ha this is what lawyers do. This is how things work in settlement conferences. That's why Brad had his lawyers on the phone. Trump had his lawyers on the phone and they were talking about election and election votes. I don't know what else they're supposed to talk about. Their grandkids. Hey, Brad, how are your kids? Hey, good, Mr. President. How are your kids? Oh, they're great. Anything else? Nope, we're good. They got to get into it. That's the whole point. Does that amount to a felony? I don't think so, but I think they can make an argument on that one. Next closely related is conspiracy to commit election fraud. So solicitation means uh, you're kind of asking somebody else to go do it. Conspiracy is more, you're actually in the conspiracy. You are conspiring to do it. So here a person commits the offense of conspiracy to commit election fraud when he or she conspires or agrees with another to actually commit a violation of this chapter. The crime shall be complete when the conspiracy or the agreement is affected and an overt act in furtherance of, of the conspiracy has been committed regardless of whether the violation of this chapter is consummated. So whether it's actually executed, right? You don't have to, uh, this is pretty typical for conspiracy statutes. You don't actually have to complete the conspiracy. As long as you do one little act in furtherance, you're okay. The analogy that I think I've used here before is if you are in a conspiracy to go rob a bank, you agree with two people to go rob a bank. You don't actually have to go rob the bank in order to do that. If you go to the sports store and buy ski masks to use in your robbery of the bank, that's an act in furtherance. It's an overt act because you went and affirmatively did something. Therefore, that's enough. That conspiracy has been effectuated even though the bank was never robbed. Okay, so they're saying that Donald Trump did something similar to that. A person convicted of this offense uh, involving a violation of this chapter, not less than one year. The rest of this looks like it is uh, what the penalties are. So did Donald Trump conspire? Did he agree with another person to commit a violation of this chapter relating to election fraud? 
I don't know. You can be the judge of that. I think it's a hard no. What's the conspiracy? What was he asking them to do? What was he conspiring to do? To, to, to steal an election? He was having a conversation with the Secretary of State about counting votes. With his lawyers, with their lawyers. Is that a conspiracy or is that just a conversation called a settlement agreement, a settlement conference, which we're going to talk about? All right, so I think that's a hard no, but it sounds good, right? Conspiracy to commit election fraud. Ooh, wow. Trump's being investigated for conspiracy to commit election fraud. Nobody else in this country is. Nobody else around, <laughs> nobody who actually ran the election is being investigated for any of this stuff. But Donald Trump is. All right, so that's okay. All right, bizarro, bizarro world. And the last charge that they were talking about is intentional interference with performance of election duties. Any person who intentionally interferes with, hinders, or delays or attempts to interfere with, hinder, or delay any other person in performance of any duty or act or any duty authorized shall be guilty of a misdemeanor. So was he interfering with? Was he hindering, delaying, attempting to interfere with? I mean, maybe you could make that argument. Okay, I, I think that he was perfectly, he, he was the candidate who ran, right? This, he, he was not some random guy who was trying to interfere with Raffensperger's performance of his duties. Okay, this isn't a, a ballot box poll worker who's refusing to deliver ballots down to the Secretary of State Counting Tabulation Center. This is the president who was also in a conversation about the election in which he just ran. He's having a conversation with the people who are conducting the election to figure out what happened. So that just sounds like normal operating procedure. Something that you would do if you're in a lawsuit with other people. You talk to them. That's not interference with the performance of their duties. That is their duty. As the Secretary of State, that's what you're elected to do, is run and, and monitor the elections and have conversations about how they're done with integrity. So it wasn't an interference with that. It was just the normal operation. But nevertheless, they are going to be uh, continuing to, you know, we're seeing this around the country. I think in New York, they're doing it. All of these prosecutors, they want to make a name for themselves. They just got elected. And so they want to puff up their resume by sticking it to Donald. And of course, Donald is sort of the least favored person in, in many circles in this country. And so it's an easy target. They just go after him. Everybody's grossed out because of the Capitol Hill stuff. The media has been dogpiling on him for months now. And it's just, a, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. So now that he's on the ropes, yeah, we'll, just, we'll investigate him for crimes. They know it's not going to go anywhere because it isn't because the statutes don't fit. But they're going to they're gonna cram that through just like we see with this impeachment proceeding because that's, that's the new standard now. We have a weaponized judiciary. We have a weaponized prosecutorial system. So it's just par for the course. Now, we, we take a look at some other statutes in Georgia. I was looking through their election code when I was trying to find those other statutes. And so here's the election code, elections and primaries, not a big section. So Article 3 here says that there are grounds to contest an election. So if you are Donald Trump, there are other areas of the Georgia law that says, yeah, if you, have, if you fall into one of these categories, you can contest your election as a result of primary or, uh, or election as a result of a primary or election, I'm sorry, a result of a primary or election may be contested on one or more of the following grounds. So accordingly, Trump, if one of the, if he fits into one of these categories, he can contest it. Okay, number one, misconduct, fraud, irregularity by any primary or election official or official sufficient to change or place in doubt the result. He was making that argument. When the defendant is ineligible for the nomination or the office in dispute, was not making that. When illegal votes have been received or legal votes rejected at the polls, sufficient to change in place the doubt of the result. Okay, He was making that argument as well. So one and three, for any error in counting the votes or declaring the result, if it would change the result, he made those arguments. We, we, we covered it in the lawsuits. For any other cause for which another person was legally nominated, or I don't think that one applies either. Okay, so one, three, and four, According to Georgia law, if you have a good argument for that, that's grounds to contest the election. So he did. Right? There were lawsuits. We covered them. There you go. Georgia, Georgia law says he's allowed to go do that stuff. He's allowed to contest it. He did. And that triggered the rest of the sequence of events. 
ultimately leading up to a settlement conference with Brad Raffensperger. Now, I looked through the election code and I was trying to find to see if they had any rules about what an election settlement conference looks like or what the negotiation structure would be under the Georgia law. And I, there wasn't anything there. So they don't have it fleshed out in their election code. So what I did is I went over to their civil practice code and I looked at what I thought sort of sort of was a resemblance of what a settlement conference looks like and here is what that one says so this would be so this would be sort of a if you're into an agreement let's say you're in a car accident and you're trying to settle your case for a particular amount of money at any time you can enter into an agreement about resolving the claim right and here for like a car accident for example they're saying you got to put all this stuff in writing you got it's got to be in writing you got to identify the parties making the proposal you got to uh, state generally the claims in the proposal that you're attempting to resolve the particularity with any relevant conditions the total amount of the proposal how much money particularity you know, punitive damages you're talking about it okay so in a car accident claim you're saying hey yeah i got my i hurt my back i hurt my neck i had to take this much time off of work i couldn't do this uh you know i i can't do things with my spouse anymore it's a problem and i'm entitled to this amount of compensation because you've got physical injuries so if you take that same analogy and you apply that to the election it's exactly what donald trump was doing I've got this injury. I think that there was something uh, wrong with with this with this outcome, and I'm negotiating with you to rectify it. I think that you, you know, in in a car accident case, you're saying, I think I deserve more for my pain and suffering. Trump says, well, I I don't think you did a good job of disqualifying those votes for whatever reason. You're negotiating about those terms. And when you have a negotiation like that, many times those negotiations are not admissible against you. In Georgia, on, again, this is not the election code. We're just trying to find something that is sort of uh, analogous, something that's similar to draw some inferences on this, on how Georgia operates these things. And here's what they say. Any offer made under this section shall be open for 30 days, should be you know, if it's withdrawn in writing, blah, 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 blah. But the, the last sentence is the most important part. Evidence of an offer is not admissible except in proceedings to enforce a settlement or determine reasonable attorney's fees. So evidence of an offer is not admissible except in proceedings. What that is saying is that that conversation alone or the stuff that came out of that conversation should be stated for the purposes of settling and resolving the case. You want people to be open and forthcoming about this stuff. You don't want it to be a situation where you are not allowed to talk about how to solve a claim or solve a case. And if you do bring that stuff forward, it's not going to be used against you. Right. And, and that this is sort of a rough structure for that. So I would think the same principle would apply in Georgia, but they're going to continue to prosecute him anyways, because it's not about getting a conviction. It's about getting a political win. Same thing that we're seeing with this impeachment.